Well, good evening. Welcome. I am Pastor Rick Williams. This is Zion Lutheran Church, and it is Wednesday, September 21st, and this is Wednesday evening Bible study and prayer. Thanks for joining me this evening. This evening we are going to be taking a look at our readings from last Sunday, which I believe was the 14th Sunday after Pentecost. A um, couple of uh, fun ones. <laughs> uh, first one was Amos, chapter 8. Not so much uh, nothing exciting going on with Amos. That's pretty straightforward. Um, but then we get into 1 Timothy, chapter 2. We're going to uh, go through that one. And this one, uh, yeah, this one can cause some controversy. We'll uh, take a bit. We'll dive into it a little bit. Maybe look a little bit at what the commentaries have to say. Um, this one's caused some division over the years. And then finally, we'll look at our gospel reading, which is Luke chapter 16. And this is the uh, parable of the shrewd manager, which also probably in all of scripture is one of the most uh, difficult parables to uh, really get your hands wrapped around. So we're going to take a look at that. And hopefully you were able to... Uh, either be in church this past Sunday and listen to Daryl or or able to watch me perhaps online uh, MSL Northland my savior lives Northland uh, on channel 6 or on their website or uh, and see what what uh, what I had to say about that um, you're also hopefully maybe even come to church tonight at 630 um, you can see that hear that message Anyway, um, but we're going to take a look at that. So those are the are the big three readings for today. Um, and then let's see, what else are we going to look at? We're going to look at announcements. Um, nothing new and pressing there other than a reminder about the Wednesday evening service. And a reminder, we've got pictures coming up. Um, October 17th and 18th are the picture-taking days for the new directory. You can schedule online. Um, you can do it at church on Sundays, um, or you can give us a call. We can help you out with that. So, uh, yeah, the more people we get, the the better it is. And uh, so, um, yeah, it, remember that. Hopefully you get signed up. Here's the other thing. If you know somebody else that you know might, might want to have a family portrait, they can sign up. And their picture doesn't have to be in the directory. And uh, they'll get the free sitting along with everybody else. They'll get a free 8x10 along with everybody else. So, uh, yeah. So if you know anybody that would like to have some family pictures taken, um, we can sign them up. All right. So let's see. Other thing we have then is our prayer list. On our prayer list tonight, we have Harold Larson and Penny Larson, Lowell Nutt, Mary Jo. I'm going to have to check, see how Mary Jo is doing. We have Dave Anderson. I have not gotten an update. I'm going to have to make a call on Dave. Dave was supposed to have <coughs> excuse me, surgery last week. And then also Diane Beiersdorf. And Diane did have surgery last week. She's home. And from what I have heard, things are going very well. So we are going to continue to pray for a uh, speedy recovery for Diane. So... Uh, let's see, let me get back to the main screen there. Now, as I mentioned, one of our readings today has some uh, a, a controversial topic in it. And that reading happens to be 1 Timothy. Um, this is one that people feel that uh, maybe uh, Paul took a little liberty and went outside the, uh, the bounds of the Holy Spirit. But... Uh, I don't think we can say that, you know. We are bound to um, take Scripture as it's written, as the true and inerrant, inspired Word of God. And uh, what are we talking about? Well, here, let's look at it. We are looking at 1 Timothy chapter 2. And let's just grab one verse in particular. How about this verse 12? I do not permit a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man. Rather, she is to remain quiet. Huh. And 
and you're chomping at the bit about that one? Wow. That, uh, that right there is one of the reasons why we have no women pastors in the LCMS. If you want some backup for that, you can try 1 Corinthians 14. I believe it's verses 33 through 35. Uh, says a very similar thing. So it doesn't occur in Scripture once, but twice. Um, and it's even inferred upon a couple of other times. So anyway, we'll talk more about that in a little while. Um, so that's kind of the introduction that I have for tonight. Um, so without any further ado, I guess what we'll do is we'll dive in, as always. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, who led your people Israel by a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. Enlighten our darkness by the light of your Christ. May his word be a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. For you are merciful, and you love your whole creation, and we, your creatures, glorify you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, so as I said, Old Testament reading first, Amos chapter 8, beginning with the fourth verse. Um, in, in, the, uh, in the Bible, if you look in the little subheading, it says, an exhortation to live justly. And actually, if you read this, it sounds like anything but, but it's kind of telling you what not to do. Um, it says, hear this. You who trample on the needy and bring the poor of the land to an end, saying, When will the new moon be over, that we may sell grain, and the Sabbath, that we may offer wheat for sale, that we may make the ephah small and the shekel great, and deal deceitfully with false balances, that we may buy the poor for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals, and sell chaff of the wheat. The Lord has sworn, sworn by the pride of Jacob, surely I will never forget any of their deeds. So yeah, basically he's telling us in this reading, uh, don't be dishonest, you know, because he's saying, hear this, you who do what? Who trample the needy? In other words, take advantage of the needy? Who bring the poor of the land to an end? If you are taking advantage of the poor, uh, not a good thing. And saying, when will the new moon be over, that we may sell grain? Um, you know, that was uh, part of the Jewish tradition. There were certain days when you couldn't sell things. It goes along with the next one. And the Sabbath, that we may offer wheat for sale. Uh, they want to just be able to sell any time. Um, I guess it would be kind of like trying to buy a new car in Wisconsin or Minnesota on a Sunday. Can't do it. Did you know that? Yeah, um, yeah, you can't sell new cars on Sundays. Why? Because people don't uh, want people to be taken advantage of on the Sabbath day, I guess. I'm surprised that law is still in the books. Um, and it says that we may make the ephah small. So in other words, instead of giving you a cup, we're going to skim a little off the top. And the shekel great, instead of giving you your 50 cents worth, we're going to only give you 40. And deal deceitfully with false balances. So instead of what you really owe you, making you pay more, or if they owe you, giving you less, that we may buy the poor for silver. Because they're poor, we have money, we can take advantage of them, we'll buy and sell. We can buy the needy for a pair of sandals. That's how badly we're going to take advantage of you. We're going to we're going to buy you into slavery for a pair of Crocs so our feet can uh, be worn, and then sell the chaff for wheat. In in this case, selling the the cheap wheat, not the good stuff, not the the, the stuff that's complete, but selling the leftover stuff that isn't worth hardly anything. But then he says, the Lord has sworn by the pride of Jacob, surely I will never forget any of their deeds. So all of you who do any of those things, trampling the needy, 
bringing the poor to an end, wanting to sell grain with the new moon or wheat for the Sabbath, those who want to make the ephah small, the shekel great, deal deceitfully with, with false balances, because you want to buy the poor for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals, you want to sell the chaff for the cheap stuff, God's going to remember that. He does not forget. And he will hold you to account for that. And that is basically what Amos is saying through the power of the Holy Spirit, that God is going to uh, remember that. So you need to live justly. That's what the point of that message at the beginning was. So there, that was quick, wasn't it? Simple, easy, not a whole lot to look at there. It's pretty straightforward. So we're going to leave that alone. If you have any questions on it, once again, as always, let me know. And now we're going to zip right into 1 Timothy chapter 2, beginning with the first verse. Now Paul is writing to the young pastor Timothy, and he says, and like I said, we'll go through it all first and then come back and dig in. First of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good, and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. For this I was appointed a preacher and an apostle. I am telling the truth. I am not lying. A teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. I desire that in every place the men should pray, lifting holy hands without anger or quarreling. Likewise also that women should adorn themselves in respectable apparel, with modesty and self-control, not with braided hair and gold or pearls or costly attire, but with what is proper for women who profess godliness with good works. Let a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness. I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. Rather, she is to remain quiet. For Adam was formed first, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. Yet she will be saved through childbearing, if they continue in faith and love and holiness with self-control. Wow, a lot of stuff going on there. First part's not so difficult to understand. We're going to take a quick look at the first part. Uh, he says, first of all, then I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for who? All people. For kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life. That's why we pray in church. We pray for the president. We pray for the Congress. We pray for the government. We pray for... You know, for state and local governments. Why? Because it's through the government and through all of those people who are where they are because God has allowed them to be there that we pray for a peaceful and quiet life. And, uh, you know, it's supposed to be godly and dignified in every way. Now, sometimes that doesn't always happen, does it? Um, you know, but we need to pray for those that are in power. And we need to do it with all our supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving. And when we pray, we don't just pray for a few or the things that we want. We pray for everybody. He says, and why? Because this is good, and it's pleasing in the sight of God, our Savior. And he says, who desires all people to be saved and come to the knowledge of truth. You know, Who's going to be saved? All people. Is that who it's intended for? Doesn't mean that everybody's going to be, but that's who it's intended for. There are some denominations out there or religions out there who do believe that everybody's going to be saved. All this other stuff about heaven and hell. God didn't really mean that. He's just trying to scare us into being submissive. And if we 
we do okay, we're, we're all going to wind up in heaven. Uh, that's not at all what he was saying here. Um, he desires all people to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Uh, but that doesn't mean that they all will. It says, for there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men. Who's that? It's the man, Christ Jesus. You know, that, that translation there has caused some issues over the millennia where Paul says the man, um, because is Christ a man? Absolutely, fully man. Um, but people forget sometimes that he is also fully God. So just because Paul points out his manliness here, the fact that he is a man, he is not in any way, shape, or form um, under stressing the fact that he is also God. And what did this man, Jesus, do? He gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. You know, that's that's what we're preaching. That's what, what Paul is preaching, right? And he says, for this, I was appointed a preacher and an apostle. That's, that's why he's there. That's why he's doing what he's doing. Because Jesus appointed him a preacher and an apostle. And just to confirm this, this is in parentheses in, in the scripture. He says, I am telling the truth. I am not lying. And believe me, it's true. He says, I am a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. What is truth? Jesus is truth, right? What does he tell us? John 14, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So, you know, he's kind of setting all that up right now. Um, you know, um, I, I think I missed it up above, the truth up above. In verse 3 it says, this is good. It's pleasing in the sight of God our Savior who desires all people to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. What's the knowledge of the truth? Who is the truth? Jesus is the truth. All people, in order to be saved, have to come to the knowledge of the truth. That's, that's It's just plain and simple fact. Yes, he would like all people to be saved, but in order for that to happen, you have to come to the knowledge of truth the truth. That's such an important step that some people feel isn't as uh, necessary as we believe that it is. So then Paul continues in verse 8. He said, I desire then that in every place the men should pray. Where should we pray? Every place we should pray. Lifting up holy hands without anger or quarreling. Father, hear my prayer. Lifting up holy hands. Now here's where he gets in here without angering or anger or quarreling. So don't be fighting over what you need to pray. Don't pray anything out of anger. You know, just do your prayers and, uh, and, and, and do a good job of it. And then he says, likewise, also, so while the men are praying there and lifting up their holy hands, likewise also that women should adorn themselves in respectable apparel. What's he talking about? How women appear when they are worshiping, when they, when they come to church, when, when they are going to be praying as well. And with what? With modesty and self-control. Not with braided hair and gold or pearl or costly attire. Why? Because those can be distracting, right? Distracting from what's going on, distracting from prayer. Also, particularly in Paul's time, if you were tending to dress like that, you might be in a position, uh, I mean, by position, I mean in a um, uh, position in life that may not be quite as reputable, if you catch my drift. But that's why he says, don't get all fancied up, don't be wearing all the braided hair and the golds and the pearls and the costly attire, you know, fancy dresses and all that. You know, we need to come to 
um, worship clothed for respect. Um, but he says, but with but with what is proper for women who profess godliness with good works. Um, if you look around the area, you might find a few denominations where they take that quite literally, right? Where the women don't um, wear any fancy jewelry or any bright clothing. Um, they always uh, are dressed uh, perhaps in... Uh, uh, what would you call it? What do you call colors that are browns and blacks and grays and, and uh, nothing fancy, not a lot of bright colors, they're not wearing any jewelry um, to help give them the appearance of what is proper for women who profess godliness with what? Oh, good works. Good works is always a challenging statement, especially for Lutherans. You know, we always have to remember those good works are the things we do because we're saved, not to be saved. Then we come into verse 11, and it says, Let a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness. All right. What he's saying here is when you're in church and you're listening to the sermon and the pastor's speaking, uh, don't interrupt him. Listen to what he has to say. If you have questions, hang on to them. Um, is that an issue nowadays? Not really. I don't think I've had anybody interrupt my sermon ever with a question or, or you know, raise a, a ruckus because of what they're hearing. But then Paul goes on, and now this is where I want us to remember that what Paul is writing is the inspired Word of God. This isn't Paul's Word. This is the Holy Spirit talking, and he says, I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. Rather, she is to remain quiet. Now, does that mean she can't speak? No. Um, but she is not to be in a position of authority over a man. Is a, is a pastor in a position of authority? Yes. Um, so, Basically, he's saying that women should not be in a position where they are preaching or teaching the Word of God in a worship setting where they have authority over men. Now, does it mean that women can't learn or can't preach or can't teach? Um, it means that in an open public setting over men. Um, can they teach Sunday school? Yep. Can they teach Bible study? Yep. Um, scripture even goes so far as saying that they can teach the elderly and, and that kind of thing. Um, it, it's, it's really more about God's order. And that's what comes up in verse 13. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. It's God's order of things. That's the way creation happened. Adam was not, and then we get into the and, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor, um, who was misled initially by the serpent, Eve, right? He uh, tempts Eve, Eve takes a bite of the apple, Eve, or the fruit, the forbidden fruit, and then Eve uh, convinces Adam to take a bite. Now, granted, he was deceived as well. But um, Paul is laying a little more of the responsibility on uh, Eve. But then he also says, yet she will be saved through childbearing. Now, does that mean that if you have a baby, you've been saved? No, it just means that that is where the position in life of the woman is. And, and it, it is, right? Men can't uh, bear children. You know, if they continue in faith and love and holiness and with self-control. So, um, faith is still the key to salvation. Now, what I wanted to do is I wanted to give you guys an idea of... Um, I'm going to open my thing up here. I've got it open. I'm just trying to make it a little bigger so I can uh, read it a little bit. I wanted to get some clarification on this, and uh, 
So I, I want to share with you. This is the opinion, because that's what commentaries are, is someone's opinion, someone's interpretation. This is the opinion of um, my good friend, Mr. Um, Kreitzman. Once again, this is written in... Uh, 1898, 1899, something like that, so 125 years ago. And let's see how he interprets this. And I, I think this might help a little bit. And then we can also maybe talk about, uh, you know, have things changed? Or should they change? Um, here's what he says. Having spoken of the appearance of women in public services, the Apostle now adds a definite prohibition. So in other words, this is picking up at verse 12, meaning, or 11, meaning, you know, how they should appear in church. He already said that. You know, they, they should uh, adorn themselves in respectable apparel and modesty and self-control and not with braided hair and all that. So now, having spoken of the appearance of the women in public service, the Apostle now adds a definite prohibition forbidding women to be public teachers of a Christian congregation but to teach I do not permit a woman nor to exercise dominion over a man but admonish her to be in silence now we have to remember Mr. Kreitzman is looking at the King James Version this he connects with his command let a woman learn in silence with complete subjection um, the Apostle Paul undoubtedly had a reason for repeating a charge which he had given once before, and that's what I spoke about. If you go to 1 Corinthians 14, verses 33 to 35, and actually, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to open that up right now. Give me a second. I should have had it open, but I didn't. And I'm going to open it up because I want to read to you um, 1 Corinthians 14. Now, my computer might be just a tad slow because we're recording here, but so far, so good. 1 Corinthians 14. And this uh, falls under orderly, in, in orderly worship and in prophecy and tongues. There, uh, huh, for I pray in a tongue of your own. Uh, for, uh, 3335 under orderly worship there we go um, for God is not a God of confusion but a God of peace as in all the churches of the saints the woman should the women should keep silent in the churches for they are not permitted to speak but should be in submission as the law also says if there is anything they desire to learn, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is shameful for a woman to speak in church. All right, so uh, that's even more um, restrictive, actually, than what Paul's saying here. Um, then he can he says, learn, this is now uh, Kreitzman speaking again, he says, learn, receive instruction, the woman should indeed, you know, so he's by, not by any means saying she shouldn't be taught what scripture says, um, and, and he also says she's no, by no means excluded from public services, so it, you know, it certainly doesn't say don't come to church or anything like that. He says, on the contrary, women often formed a very large and prominent part of the congregation as they do in virtually all congregations today. I think it's safe to say we, every Sunday, have more women in church than we do men. Um, women often formed a very large and prominent part of the congregations, as their frequent mention in the New Testament indicates. We see women mentioned in the church all of the time in the New Testament. But this learning of the woman was to be done in quietness and silence. She was not to interrupt the sermons or doctrinal discussions in public services by questions or remarks of her own. Now, once again, this is in public services. This doesn't refer to, like, when we have our Bible study after worship on Sunday, um, it certainly doesn't mean that the women who are in part of that Bible study can't ask questions, because that isn't 
a public service. That's where we're having a discussion and, and that type of thing. Um, you know, and part of this falls back to perhaps an old way of worship where sometimes there would be discussion during the worship, but we, we generally as a rule don't do that nowadays. Um, so anyway, um, her position is indeed in many questions pertaining to the household one of coordination in the public life and teaching of the congregation. However, strictly one of subordination, one of complete subjection. I know, especially nowadays, there are probably a lot of women who do not wish to think of nor believe that their role when it comes to public teaching of the word is um, um, subordination or even one of complete subjection. Uh, there's a lot of denominations with female pastors that would certainly argue that point. Um, but as Mr. Kreitzman says here regarding Paul's letter, public teaching of the word is not permitted to women. They are not to become preachers or teachers of the congregation as such. He also adds, although they may very well teach children and young people outside of public service. And that's the key word, outside of public service. You know, as far as I'm concerned, Bible study, anything else, um, that's fine because they're not in that position of authority. The position of authority comes during the public worship and during the administration of the sacraments. And then he says they may also give individual instruction to old, older people. And there's reference to that in Titus, and there's reference to that in Acts. But then he adds, but in no way and at no time shall the woman exercise dominion over the man, neither in public worship, by presuming to be a public teacher, well, here's one that might raise an eyebrow or two, nor at home, nor in any other sphere of activity. And that one will, maybe we'll have to have a discussion about this. That might be a good one for an open discussion to talk about. The apostle once more emphasizes that she should be in silence, that her role is that of a listener and learner in public and not that of a teacher. And once again, the key word in public. The highest excellent of excellence of the Christian woman is that of following her calling in the quiet seclusion of the home. Ooh. Yeah. The apostle now supports his rule of silence on two grounds. And this is where we get into that last part. It says, For Adam was created first, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman, overcome by deceit, was in the transgression. The priority of Adam's creation is thus a testimony for the order of God that the man should lead and rule for all times. Yeah, God created man first. Then God made the woman as a helpmate for man. The subordination of women holding good even before the fall. So even before that bite of the fruit, the woman was in a subordinate position to the man. So he continues, the woman was and should be in the relationship of dependency to the man. I know a lot of women out there that if you tell them they're in a relationship of dependency with their men are probably going to throw things at me. Um, but then Dr. Kreitzman continues, from which it follows that her status should not be that of leader or teacher in the church. Once again, saying, once again, not in the public light. In the second place, the story of the first man shows that there was no temptation and fall as long as he was alone. This is, this is kind of an interesting statement here. You don't have to bear with me on this one. Um, and I'm not 100% sure on... on uh, you know, that I agree with Mr. Kreitzman's interpretation. All right. Um, 
But in the second place, the story of the first man shows that there was no temptation and fall as long as he was alone. As soon, however, as the woman, a weaker vessel, was pre present, Satan made his attack. Thus, Adam was not deceived, was not seduced, but Eve was overcome by the devil's deception. She fell into the trap set by the enemy and then persuaded her husband to join her in the foolish transgression. So the fall was brought about, which, in its sad results, continues to this hour. Um, okay. Here again, the subordination of the woman is plainly shown, a fact that excludes her from being a teacher in public worship where her office would give her dominion over man. In order, however, to guard against the idea as if the subordination of women in any way reduces her right and her participation in the blessing of the gospel, the apostle adds a word of comfort. So in other words, just because it, as he's saying here, it was her fault, that doesn't mean she's still not receiving the blessings of the gospel. But he says, but she will be saved through childbearing if they remain in faith and love and holiness with sobriety. St. Paul, <coughs> this now is the writing of Luther. Luther says, St. Paul, taking the common sense view that childbearing, rather than public teaching or the direction of affairs, meaning running things, is a woman's primary function, duty, privilege, and dignity. And Paul reminds Timothy and his readers that there was another aspect of the story in Genesis besides that of the woman taking the initiative in transgression. The pains of childbirth were her sentence, yet in undergoing these she finds her salvation. All right. So, it says, No, indeed, as though childbearing were a means of earning salvation, but the home, the family, motherhood is a woman's proper sphere of activity. Don't throw anything at me. Don't break your television or your computer or your phone or whatever you're watching. Once again, these are Mr. Kreitzman's words or Dr. Kreitzman's words, not mine. I, I'm going to put, we, let's put out a bold billboard. It says, indeed, as though childbearing were a means of rain, but... The home, the family, motherhood is a woman's proper sphere of activity. That's where all you ladies need to be. That, what, boy, oh boy. Every normal woman should, end, oh, here's another great one. Remember now, this is written in 1898. Every normal woman should enter holy wedlock, become a mother, and rear children if God grants her the gift of babies on her own. This is a woman's highest calling. For this, God has given her physical and mental gifts. Now, before you finish breaking my television or throwing things at me or calling me names, I want to challenge you to look around our community and let me know next time you see me if you know of anyone or any group who follows this doctrine to the T. And are they right or are they wrong? All right, think about that. That's what I want you to think about. And then Dr. Kreitzman figures out, finishes up. He says, unless God himself directs otherwise, a woman misses her purpose in life if she does not become a helpmate of her husband and a mother of children. This is true of all Christian women if they perform all these works of their calling in the faith, in the Redeemer, and in the consequent unselfish love, in the sanctification which seeks to make progress day by day. In this way, they all exercise the moderation, the sobriety, the chaste watchfulness over sinful lusts, and desires which effectively drive out lewd passion and make all the members of the body instruments in the service of God. That last statement was also another Luther statement. So, now that you, uh, if there's any women out there watching this evening that you hate me, um, we have to remember that when Mr. Kreitzman wrote this, 
uh, things were certainly a lot different than they are now, right? But the point is, some of what he says still holds true. And even though we might not practice it like they used to, um, we have to consider and take into account God's intent, God's order, God's design. And because of that, that is why we still believe, at least in the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, that women should not be pastors. You know, um, now, in our world today, things have changed and society has changed, but the thing we have to remember is even though all those things change, Scripture doesn't change. And while we can change to a degree to live in the world today, we still need to be true to Scripture. So, where's that line? There's the question for you. Anyway, um, I'm going to hang on to this little Kreitzman piece, and if anybody would like to uh, go over it with me at some point, I'd be more than happy. You know, we were talking about a Bible study for Sunday. Maybe this would be a good one. Um, but uh, we'll, we'll think about that. Anyway, um, I think I'm going to finish up on 1 Timothy chapter 2 with that one. And uh, you know what? Here's what I'm going to do. Um, I'm going to read through the gospel. Uh, Luke 16, Jesus also said to the disciples, there was a rich man who had a manager, and charges were brought to him that his, this man was wasting his possessions. And he called him and said to him, what is this I hear about you? Turn in the account of your management, for you no longer, you can no longer be manager. And the manager said to himself, what shall I do, since my master is taking the management away from me? I am not strong enough to dig. I am ashamed to beg. I've decided what to do, so that when I am removed from management, people may receive me into their houses. So he summoned his master's debtors one by one, and he said to the first, How much do you owe my master? He said, A hundred measures of oil. He said to him, Take your bill and sit down quickly and write fifty. And he said to another, How much do you owe? And he said, A hundred measures of wheat. And he said to him, Take your bill and write 80. The master commended the dishonest manager for his shrewdness. For the sons of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than the sons of light. And I tell you, make friends for yourself by means of unrighteous wealth, so that when it fails, they may receive you <coughs> into the eternal dwellings. One who is faithful in a very little is also faithful in much, and one who is dishonest in very little is also dishonest in much. If then you have not been faithful in the unrighteous wealth, who will entrust you to true riches? And if you have not been faithful in that which is another's, who will give you that which is your own? No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. The Pharisees, who were lovers of money, heard all these things, and they ridiculed him. And he said to them, You are those who justify yourselves before men, but God knows your hearts. For what is exalted among men is an abomination in the sight of God. Now, I am not going to go through all of this. We just simply don't have time. But what I would urge you to do, if you'd like, um, go online. And if you haven't seen it already, um, watch uh, my sermon from Sunday. It's, uh, it's on the Facebook page, um, you know, the Zion Facebook page. It's also on mslnorthland.com. Um, and, and take a look at it. And I, I think it does a fairly good job about talking about this. Um, I am going to talk about a couple, just a couple parts of it. Um, you know, one of the things in is it says the master commended the dishonest ma manager for his shrewdness. You know, he commends them for what he did. You know, and, and basically the statement is kind of like, you were so shrewd now to save yourself. Why weren't you that shrewd when you were dealing with my money? And uh, I see my picture froze. I'm not sure why. Um... Is it still recording? No, everything froze. 
Why did everything freeze? Okay, now we're back. I'm not sure how much we lost there. We froze for a second, but basically I was saying, uh, you know, the, he's saying, why, uh, why weren't you this shrewd with, with my money when you were running it for me? You were shrewd enough to save yourself, but you wouldn't be in the position of saving yourself if you would have been. And then he talks about how um, uh, he says, for the sons of the world are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than the sons of light. In other words, um, people dealing with other people in the world tend to be very shrewd and, 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 and play each other. And, and that sometimes uh, the people of light, the Christians, uh, aren't that shrewd. And maybe, maybe we should be a little more. Um, but then he says, if you have, then you have not been faithful in the unrighteous wealth, who will trust you with true riches? Um, if you have not been faithful in that which is another's, who will give you that which is your own? Right? Um, that's the situation with this manager. He wasn't faithful with his master's money, so he knows he's not going to find another job because who's going to trust him now that he's lost, you know, he did that. And, you know, why wasn't he faithful with it? Because he was splurging, he was spending it, he was doing whatever. Um, and this is where Jesus says, no servant can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. And, and here's the, the word boils down. You cannot serve God and money. You can't do it. You can't do it. You'll love one or hate the other, and, or love the other and hate the one, you know. So God always needs to be first. And if you think back about all of the stuff that we've been talking about over the last few weeks, it all has to do with God being first. And that can be a hard thing to do, particularly in this world, is keeping God first. It can be a challenge. It can be a big challenge. So, anyway, um, like I say, if you want to talk about that more, we can dig into it at some point. Come see me. Um, but, yeah. So, anyway, this one's run kind of long. We're already almost at 50 minutes already. So, what I'm going to do is just have a quick prayer, particularly for those on our prayer list, and then we'll close up with the Lord's Prayer and we'll call it a night. So, uh, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for all the blessings that you bestow on us each and every day. We uh, thank you for um, favorable weather, the abundance of fruit from the earth. We, we thank you for peaceful times. Lord, we ask that you deliver us from all affliction, wrath, and danger, and need. And Lord, we bring before you this evening those with special concerns or needs, um, including Harold and Penny. Lowell and Mary, uh, Dave Anderson and Diane Byersdorf, Lord, watch over all of them. Um, oh, I need to check too. I had heard, Lord, that Harold was in the hospital. I'm hoping that he has since been released. I'll have to try and get a hold of him. Lord, uh, watch over all of them. Help them uh, to recover as be your will. Keep them in your care. Lord, we also wish to pray for those who may be grieving those who are unemployed or underemployed, the chronically ill, the shut-in, and all those whose needs we don't even know about. Lord, you know what they need, and we pray that you deliver them. Lord, we ask all this in the name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever amen once again thanks for joining me this evening if you've got any questions because it's certainly an interesting topic tonight let me know i'd be more than happy to talk to you about it and I look forward to seeing you all again soon, whether it be Sunday or, or uh, Bible study Monday or whatever. Um, yeah. And like I say, if you got any questions, thoughts, comments, give me a call. Come visit me. Uh, yeah. Love to talk to you about it. So have a good evening. Um, my friends, the Lord bless you and keep you. 
The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. God bless and good night.